Now I'm going to have Jane explain what she does. You don't see her on the air, but she's a producer and she'll explain to you what a producer does in some of her stories. Can you reload this? Yeah. Thanks for just loading up another DVD. While, while uh, that's happening, Carrie, how much sleep did you get in Chile? <laughs> There is no sleep. There is no, no sleep. sleep. I, I, I was in a, uh, we rented a Winnebago. We parked it, that, that's in the city that you saw, but obviously we were out in the, uh, in the desert for a long time. Okay. So we had a Winnebago there and every day I was afraid this might be the day, this might be the day. So as we went into the last week <coughs> and a half, I never went back into the city, which was about uh, an hour and a half to two hours away. I just slept in the Winnebago. And again, out in the middle of what looked like a moonscape. And so, uh, you know, you bring your own food, you bring your own water, you bring everything. Thankfully, it wasn't a tent. You know, we could actually get a Winnebago down there. But, uh, you know, it's in the same way that the first responders are at the location um, in, the, uh, in the collapsed supermarket, that Turkish team and the American team that later arrived. They were there for like two weeks and nobody left. I mean, they're, they're sleeping there, they're eating there, they're doing everything at that location. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Jane Daranowski. I'm a producer for NBC Network News. I specialize uh, mostly in science and health topics. And uh, what's interesting about science or health is that uh, our viewers are either afraid they're going to get what we're talking about, as in the disease or the ailment. Uh, maybe they know someone who has it or uh, they're worried about getting it. So it's a high interest topic. Um, where disaster is concerned, that's a whole other matter. But uh, what I wanted to talk about a little bit, you see Carrie on the air, you see our correspondents on the air, but nobody really knows what a producer does. My parents are still a little sketchy about what they paid for in college. Um, we work behind the scenes with correspondents, photographers, engineers, um, assignment editors, public relations specialists to organize and facilitate what you end up seeing on the air. Um, I work a great deal with uh, people in public health, doctors, nurses, first responders. I find myself in hospitals very, very often covering stories from uh, last year's swine flu, uh, to SARS, to AIDS, to you name it, on the public health spectrum. So uh, I always appreciate when I'm able to go into a situation like Haiti where, you know, there isn't pre-warning. You know, it's a whole different situation. So um, what I want to start with, who, who here is in public health or first responder? Okay, so we have quite a few. And who here are journalists or broadcast students or communication students? Okay, great. Uh, what I want to ask of all of you first, um, does anybody have a plastic bag? You have a plastic bag. Uh, anybody have $100 or more in small bills on them right now? No, no. Uh, power bar? Passport. Who has their passports with them right now? Okay, very good. Um, you're, you're on the next plane out of Boston to the next disaster. Um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about, and Carrie made a great point, if you aren't prepared, you're part of the problem. And I want to show you a little bit about what I travel with. I mean, I think people think you're jet setting all over. You know, it's true, one day I'll find myself in Haiti, the next day in Iceland, um, covering a volcano eruption, or, you know, down in Katrina, or at 9-11. Um, you don't have forewarning. And, uh, you know, people are always hearing, oh, you're heading off to London or to Haiti or something. This is what I travel with. This is my glamorous luggage collection. These bags go with me every place. And, um, uh, oh, the cameraman is signaling over here, over here. Uh, you know, this is a, a canvas bag, and this is my purse. Uh, <laughs> this is nothing uh, designer here, but with what this isn't working either. Um, with what I have in these bags, with what Kerry has in his backpack, it's very MacGyver-like. Uh, right now we could go pretty much any place in the world. Uh, just on a practical notice, this, uh, and I won't, you know, unpack everything. You got your passport, $100 in small bills. There's a blackout right now. You got a little money. You got power bars. 
and beef jerky. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these things sound very silly, and, and no fewer than three cameras. Uh, video camera, still camera, Blackberry camera. Um, clothes for a, rainy, for a rainy situation, boots with hard soles. You know, I don't carry the boots everywhere. I'm not that crazy. Um, medicine for a month. Medicine for a month. If you take medicine, bring enough for a month, always have it on you. You may not get to go home. Uh, often we don't, as Carrie can, uh, can attest to. Oftentimes we'll be in the middle of something like this and get a call and say, we need you on the next plane. You know, something just happened in Egypt or in Haiti or someplace like that. So um, preparation is key. Um, if you go to a situation with your team and you're fumbling around because you've you've lost your passport or you don't have powdered Gatorade and you're not going to be able to go on because you're sweating in Haiti and uh, you, you don't have your electrolytes, you know, you, you don't have enough water, you're going to be left behind career-wise. And as first responders, you're not going to be able to treat the people that you're there to serve. Um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit is the similarities between first responders and the media. I think we have a lot more in common than it, than it seems. We both have to rush into disasters. Um, and a, as a journalist, as Carrie said, I have the honor of telling your stories, the public health workers. Um, I've chosen three reports from my time in Haiti which I feel exemplify the ideal in cooperation. As Carrie mentioned, this was one of those things where it was a very good relationship. It was very easy to cover once we got there. Now, getting there was a whole different story. That was an odyssey. Um, for us particularly, uh, I left on January 13th, 2010, my birthday. I was told at 3 o'clock that I had to be on an 8 p.m. plane. Um, they didn't know how they were going to get us into Haiti, but we flew into the Dominican Republic, and uh, it, took, it took a day to get there, traveling in buses and, and so forth. I'll discuss that later, but um, I have three goals with this that shows the cooperation between journalists and public health workers and how they can come together to create really, really good stories. Um, each of them has one of the following. The importance of preparation, how to communicate well, and the importance of establishing networks between journalists and public health workers slash first responders. Um, I primarily work with our chief science correspondent, Robert Bazell, and I'm going to show you the reports we put together from the moment we hit the ground in Haiti. Welcome back to Port-au-Prince. Even before the earthquake, this city had a woeful shortage of health care centers in hospitals. And now, severely injured people are being treated in some of the most primitive conditions you might imagine. Tonight, NBC's chief science correspondent Robert Brazell takes us behind the gates to the city's main hospital. Hundreds of critically injured patients and their families have been waiting outside Port-au-Prince General, the city's largest hospital. Seven out of ten buildings here were destroyed. There is no electricity, few staff, and little supplies. Pijan Duverdia's daughter was crushed to death in their five-story apartment, but he managed to bring in his niece, Sime, who has multiple severe injuries and still waits in the 95-degree sun. He says the niece's infections are getting worse quickly. Today, some care began as some staff and volunteers arrived. Jereen Berna was cooking dinner when the quake struck and boiling water spilled on her two-year-old son, Tyson. A nurse puts bacterial lotion on the severe burn. Last night, the first volunteer doctors from Partners in Health arrived, and in the dark, they triaged the patients to determine who should get care first, like this woman. She has an infected, traumatic amputation. In other words, her foot was cut off during the earthquake. So it's a priority for us. We've got to control that infection, and the only way to do this is to re-amputate at a higher level. The doctors are operating without electricity. There is no time to spare. Five days of open wounds, it's, they're all contaminated. 
What will the future hold for those patients who survive? Dr. Ernest Benjamin, a Haitian by birth, works at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. You will try to get prosthesis for these people if you can. If we can. But again, that will be later on. Right now, if the person needs prosthesis, that means already half a success. That means we already saved the life. At the hospital morgue, the bodies of those saved and those simply dropped off are piling up on the street with no more room inside. All day long, dazed people pour in, searching for family or friends. Ousseline was looking for Beatrice, her best friend from school. More patients keep arriving as the race to save them picks up ever so slowly. Robert Bazell, NBC News, Port-au-Prince. Going to end in Haiti tonight. There was a moment just this past Friday when we saw it arrive, and so we took these pictures. That's the aircraft carrier Carl Vinson. It was visible on the horizon. That meant help had arrived. The men and women of the Vinson have been saving lives, and over the weekend, they even welcomed a new one. Our report tonight from NBC's Robert Bazell on board the Carl Vinson. We flew in a Navy Seahawk helicopter to the USS Carl Vinson. 17 miles offshore from Port-au-Prince. The ship has been taking in a steady stream of casualties, most of them picked up on the streets by U.S. troops. Patients like Vinyan Joseph, whose shattered leg had been so infected that it had to be amputated. <laughs> Commander Alfred Schwehat, the ship's senior medical officer, told me the medical capacity is small, set up to treat sailors on this and other ships in the carrier group. This is our med general medical surgical ward that's occupied by patients, as you can see. At times since the earthquake, the medical staff has had to work 40-hour shifts. When the earthquake hit, the Carl Vincent was on maneuvers off Florida. It was the closest American ship. It got here very quickly and performed some of the first emergency operations. The crew was thrilled to learn of the mission. We couldn't wait to get here. Everybody's favorite case is Jean Burin. She was found in the rubble deep in labor. The choppers brought her to the Carl Vinson, where she gave birth to a baby boy Saturday. She named Vinson in honor of the ship and crew. I talked to her through an interpreter. Your first child? No, that's the first child. The, the baby uh, is perfectly healthy? Yes. Oh. The medical staff of the Carl Vinson saved many lives from injuries typical in earthquakes. But they take special pride that Vinson is a sign that life in Haiti will go on. Robert Bazell, NBC News, offshore of Port-au-Prince. The two of us uh, combined have seen more doctors and nurses these past few days than you see in an average year in the States, which brings us to our chief science correspondent, Bob Bazell, who's been coming here for a long time and, of course, is here under different circumstances now. Indeed, uh, Brian, one of the first things I did today when I arrived was to go visit an old friend, a physician who has been treating AIDS here in Haiti for 25 years. This is a catastrophe. Dr. Marie Marcel Deschamps has been in a controlled frenzy since the earthquake. Residents of the nearby slums quickly filled up the grounds of the Geskio Clinic, the only medical facility nearby. We had to deal with poverty, HIV AIDS, hurricane, but hunger, we have to deal with all those social political issues, but this was really unexpected. Many are homeless, uh -huh. but there are dozens with severe injuries at this facility set up to treat AIDS. As, as you can see, we are overwhelmed. Over here, we put the mother and the infant. Over here, as you can see, mother and infant. We're trying to bring them food and water. I understand. They have been there for three days. They want more than what we are giving, and I understand that. Dr. Dusham and the other doctors and nurses here have done the best they can but they are out of almost everything, especially to treat severe injuries like severed limbs. She came like that, so we had to make sure that... But you managed stop to stop the, the bleeding? The bleeding. Yeah. That's why we had to do, at least. But she lost the arm uh, uh -huh. the first night. USAID has promised to set up a temporary surgical facility here. It was supposed to happen today. Maybe it will happen tomorrow. A hopeful sign the first volunteer doctors arrived today. And Dr. Deshaun, a patriot, remains optimistic about her country. We'll get out of it, I'm confident. We need to rebuild Haiti. One of the reasons there is some hope and optimism here, Brian, is that because there are people like that who truly believe in this place, despite all its tragedy, they believe in the people 
and its future and its past. Well, what a challenge to get over in the near term. I know you'll be here to cover it. Okay. So I ended with that report because that is the first report that we filed when we got to Haiti. We arrived in Haiti on a bus after a 10 hour trip from uh, 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 the Dominican Republic. We drove all night. We arrived in Haiti at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, that report went on the air at 6.30. So we hit the ground running, not knowing where we were going to stay, what we were going to eat, where we were going to you know, park ourselves. Uh, what we had done in preparation is on the way to the Dominican Republic and on the way from the Dominican Republic to Haiti, we used our contacts to secure um, a car, a driver and an interpreter. So when you are a first responder, utilize that time before you get to the, to the area to make sure you have what you need once you get there to do it. Um, that speaks to the preparation issue. Um, establishing relationships cannot be underestimated. Bob Bazell has been working with that woman at that clinic, that doctor, for over 20 years, as he said. He knew enough to just reach out to her. That's where we're going to go. We're going to hit the ground. We're going to go to that location. We knew there would be injured there. And not only did it become a hospital for the injured, but hundreds of thousands of homeless set up camp in the backyard of that clinic and continued to do so for months. Uh, so when we went to revisit it the first time and the second time and the third time, we could get snapshots of how the disaster had progressed. It was there progress, that sort of thing. So establishing relationships is one of the key things. Um, you know, often we're, the public relations people for hospitals or for health workers are, you know, trying to make sure things are controlled and look good in a certain light. We're trying to get the story. I got probably 20 or 30 emails a day from uh, contacts in the United States that I had built at hospitals over the years saying, you know what, we're sending a team down. They're going to be at such and such location in Haiti on such and such a day. That helped enormously. The fact that maybe I check in with them once a month, say, hey, how's it going? They knew enough to contact me. It made our lives so much easier once we got there because we knew there were professionals that we could rely on to tell the stories that we needed to hear. So for any broadcast students, maintaining your contacts is absolutely essential. Um, and showing the doctors, nurses, first responders the respect um, and, and, uh, and kindness in that situation. You know, it's stressful enough. A little kindness, a little compassion goes a long way when dealing with each other in those situations. Um, there are people you saw in those stories, the healthcare professionals, the first responders, that we put on the air because of their communication. Um, they were succinct speakers. They uh, were able to briefly tell us what they were seeing, make it relatable without using too much doctor jargon, um, about the crisis at hand and the challenges uh, that they faced in the days, weeks, and months to come in that crisis. Now, this one was particularly bad because of the amputations. Um, in hindsight, whenever I think of that first story that I showed you, what I wish I had showed you was that the doctors came prepared. There was no anesthetic. They were just, you know, uh, uh, amputating limbs without any anesthetic. Uh, what some of the doctors brought were gallon jugs of absolute vodka. And I, I still have regrets that I didn't have the cameraman pan in on that because that's what they were using as anesthetic and to clean wounds. Um, that's what they had. That's what they brought. They made do, and people survived because of their forethought and preparation. You know, maybe they got it in the Dominican Republic, brought it over, knowing, hey, this is a third world country. They're not going to have the things we have back at home. Um, so that was an excellent example of their preparation. Um, in closing, I want to talk a little bit about the most crucial aspect of working success successfully in a, a disaster situation, and that's self-preservation. You know, you saw a lot of awful things on there. You saw the bodies stacked up. In Carrie's piece, you saw that they had to uh, burn bodies to make space at the hospitals. 
Those were things that we were right next to. Those are things that healthcare professionals and first responders are going to be right next to. Um, you cannot imagine the smell um, and, and how we were literally holding on to each other to keep from slipping in, in the blood that was running in the streets. Um, and you're tired, you have not slept, you haven't eaten. Um, maybe you have, you, you know, if you're prepared, you had your, your snacks and your water and your Gatorade. Um, Self-preservation in those moments is going to save you. Um, by self-preservation, I mean when you can, take even just one minute to step back, take a few deep breaths, and, and let yourself think about how you're going to move on. Um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking is you're going to be driving, you're going to be walking, you have to recenter. You have to recenter or you're not going to be of any use to anybody. Um, you can process the disaster later, but in the situation when you have to get a story on the air, when you have to um, take off a limb with a chainsaw, um, you must take even just a minute or two minutes during this crisis to have a moment of reflection and to get the energy to move on. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much.